The skill we're learning this week is one that I desperately need our citizens to have. I need you to be able to think through what politicians and other people are saying about things like COVID and healthcare and police brutality. And I need you to be one of the few people in my community that is actually rational. I need you to be able to listen and read people's arguments and judge them coherently and rationally. Please, we need real health care. Stop listening to all the terrible arguments and find out good arguments. All right, sorry. So, like I said before, I will simply tell you when we're dealing with induction versus deduction. So, this week and next week will be strictly induction. These are all inductive skills. And then two weeks from now, we will switch to completely deduction. We've done the whole semester actually in induction. So you'll see two weeks from now, it'll be a very special way of thinking and it'll be symbolic logic. So induction this week and next week. As we said before, the goal of an inductive argument is to increase the likelihood of, likelihood of the conclusion. And so this is now a term we need to have. We need to be able to judge what's called the strength of an inductive argument. What makes an inductive argument strong or weak? How well the evidence increases the likelihood of the conclusion. So this is all it means. So if we're to define strength or what makes an argument strong, it is simply a judgment of how likely the conclusion is based on the evidence. Now notice what I said there. If you have an inductive argument and the conclusion is something that you already know is true, you still want to judge the argument's strength based on how well the evidence proves that conclusion. Sorry, proves is too strong. How much that evidence makes a conclusion likely. So if someone says 2 plus 2 equals 4 as a conclusion, now you know that's true. But if their argument for it is because I like the number 2, you would say, okay, that conclusion is true, but your argument is terribly weak. You didn't give good evidence for that conclusion. All right, fine. So what makes an argument strong? Well, there are three traits. And as usual, these are already in your head. In order to show you that you already have these in your guts, these are already intuitive, let me give you three terrible arguments and you tell me what's wrong with them. Because these will be the three things that determine the strength of an inductive argument. We will give, you know me well enough by now that you know this is going to be hideous and immature, let me give you three <laughs> terrible arguments for I am the world's greatest lover. Argument number one. I am the world's greatest lover because I can grow a glorious thick beard every winter. Is that a good argument? No. Why? Why is that argument weak? Why is, based on that evidence, it's not likely that that would make me the world's greatest lover? Easy. That evidence is simply not relevant to that conclusion. It might be some cool coincidence in my case, but what does having a beard have to do with being the world's greatest lover? Exactly. So the first trait an argument needs, an inductive argument needs to be strong, is the evidence has to be relevant to the conclusion. All right, let me try another one. Sorry, argument two. I am the world's greatest lover because I have slept with 3,486 women and all of these women attest under oath that I am the world's greatest lover they could ever imagine. What do you think of that argument? Sounds okay, but what's the problem? It's false. I'm lying. I haven't slept with that many women. I mean, if you slept with one woman, you've slept with them all, right? No, no. Right? Okay. That is simply untrue. Because the evidence is untrue, it doesn't help my conclusion. So what is the second trait evidence must have? Evidence must be truthful. If your evidence isn't true, it doesn't increase the likelihood of your conclusion. Good. So first two traits. Good evidence must be both relevant and truthful. All right. Third trait, third argument. Here is another reason why I'm the world's greatest lover. Okay, new argument. I am the world's greatest lover because wifey says I am. My wife says I'm the greatest lover that she could ever imagine in the whole universe. What do you think of that argument? Well, yes, it's terrible, but what's your explanation? 
Now, we could say something like, my wife is biased, or maybe you just say, my wife is lying, and we're back to truthfulness. But this one has a slightly different trait. What's the problem? That's not enough evidence. Even if that evidence were true, right? It, no, it is relevant, but there's just not enough of it. Saying one woman thinks I'm the world's greatest lover is not nearly enough evidence for how incredibly big and generalized that, that conclusion is. That conclusion needs a lot of evidence before it would be plausible at all. So we have our third trait. The evidence must be sufficient, meaning there must be enough of it based on how plausible the conclusion is. Get it. Now, so notice, if you had a conclusion that was fairly believable, like you had a conclusion like, I went for a walk yesterday, well, that's pretty easy to believe, it's not going to need a lot of evidence, but something like, I'm the greatest lover in the whole world, that's going to need a lot more relevant and truthful evidence in order to, for you to say the evidence is sufficient for that conclusion. Good? We've got it. Three traits. So now we have to learn how to analyze strength carefully so you won't be fooled by stupid politicians telling you that we have the greatest healthcare in the world. Oh my God. Okay, so now we need to learn how to analyze each of these three traits in order to determine the strength of an inductive argument. First, so for the first two steps, what we need to do is go premise by premise and judge them one at a time. We have to judge them in terms of relevance and truthfulness. So step one, judge each premise by relevance. Here's the key thing. You should think of yourself as answering this question. If I assume that that premise is true, how much does that increase the likelihood of the conclusion? Is this the kind of evidence that this, this conclusion really needs? Is this relevant? And again, to trick your brain into focusing on relevance and not getting distracted by truthfulness, because our brain does that together. We need to get our brain to do one step at a time. So just tell yourself, I'm going to assume this is true. Let's just assume this is true. What impact will that have on the likelihood of the conclusion? Is this the kind of evidence that would increase the likelihood of this conclusion, or is it off topic or not relevant? But again, the issue of truth will come up later, so tell your brain. Let's assume this is true and see if it helps. Step two, go through each premise and ask, is this actually true? Now, in the most basic sense, this is the easiest step because you're just literally checking your guts and seeing if you know that to be true. Now, of course, we're going to run into plenty of premises that we don't have direct guts on. So you should also say something about, if you don't know this directly, how possible is this to be true? Meaning, is this very probable to be true? Is this possible to be true? Or is this impossible to be true based on an estimate of your guts? If you know it's true, just say so and say why you know it's true. Oh, I read about that. I was there. That's something I know. But if it's not, give me a basic general sense of how possible it is. So that you don't just say, don't ever give me an answer of, I have no idea if, it's that, if that's true. Good. So after you've looked at each premise in terms of relevance and truthfulness, then we need to judge sufficiency. So for sufficiency, we're looking at all of the evidence together based on what we just analyzed. Here is the key issue. A premise does not help your conclusion at all if the premise isn't at least a little relevant and a little truthful at the same time. Now, of course, if it's just a little relevant and a little truthful, it's only going to help your conclusion a little bit. But if a premise is relevant and not true, it doesn't help your conclusion at all. If it's true and not relevant, it doesn't help your conclusion at all. So the first thing we want to do when judging sufficiency is look for that. Look to see, does each of your premises, does it have both relevance and truthfulness? If it doesn't have at least a little of both, then it doesn't help at all. So maybe you will find for this first step of sufficiency, this step three we'll do in two parts. So maybe when you're looking at the first part of this, you'd say, oh wow, I've got three premises, two of them aren't relevant, and the third one is not true. What do you have? Nothing. So at this first step, you're looking back at your anal analysis for parts one and two and seeing, is there evidence that's both relevant and truthful? 
For the, step, the second step of this step three sufficiency, then you want to make sure you're not being tricked by your author. The writer of the argument might be really clever like me or like politicians, and they've kind of misled you the whole time. So for this step, you want to ask, is there evidence that's missing that should be considered? What, when I look at this conclusion, what kind of evidence should be included in this argument? What kind of evidence would make it strong? What kind of evidence do we need to check to, that might make it weak? So you're thinking, using your general guts, stepping back from the argument, not being fooled by this little universe that the author of the argument has created, and thinking, okay, let me look more generally, what sort of evidence should also be included in this discussion that might affect the likelihood of this conclusion? All right. So then lastly, we've gone through our three big steps, relevance, truthfulness, sufficiency, and now judging strength should be easy. To be honest, we usually judge strength very intuitively before we do this analysis. So you could say this analysis is just making sure we're not being tricked by something. And so we're going very carefully through our three traits to see if we miss something. The way we will answer this strength will simply be the most basic judgment of likelihood, which is to give it a percentage. Please note what we mean by this percentage. You will simply be giving it a number. If the number is above 50%, you are saying this is more likely than not. If it's under 50%, you're saying this conclusion is unlikely based on this evidence. But try to be very articulate in your choice. If you say an argument is 90% strong, notice that's all you have to write for strength is a number percentage. If you're saying it's 90% strong, you are saying this is very likely to be true based on the evidence that's given. If an argument it is incredibly weak, there is almost no way it can be true, then give it a very small number. Now notice, some of you are thinking, oh, I'm going to trick Jeff and I'm just going to put 50% for every argument. Sorry, 50% is not a very good guess at strength. It is very rare that an inductive argument will be 50% strong. Notice, you are saying that you've looked at this evidence and it's just as likely to be true as to be false. Sorry, that is very unlikely to happen in an argument. It is very atypical for it to be 50-50. Even if it's an argument you know very little about, it's still very likely going to be on the strong side or on the weak side. Let me say one last thing. Please note, that when I look at your percentage, and this is going to be a very small part of your grade on a big quiz, when I look at your percentage, I'm going to be grading it just based on whether it's in a reasonable range. Note, you will give me a very specific number, 92%, 38%, 5%, whatever, very specific. And then I'm going to be grading on a range that seems reasonable. So if I say, if I think looking at this, oh, they should see that this argument is very strong, well, then anything like 85, 90, 95 percent, if it's very strong, I will consider that full credit. If you're close to the reasonable range, I'll give that half credit. But again, you are not guessing the range. You are guessing a specific number. I will just grade based on a range. So now, next video, we will try a bunch of these. Please note, this is a pretty tricky skill during the semester. This is a part of the class that does challenge people quite a bit. So please be patient. I'm going to next go over a bunch of examples in the next video. Thanks.